Good afternoon, everybody. Um, we'll go ahead and start the uh, webinar this evening. So welcome to our webinar this evening, the growth of crowdfunding real estate investments brought to you by the Center for Real Estate Entrepreneurship of the George Mason School of Business. For those of you that don't know uh, about us, the Center for Real Estate Entrepreneurship is George Mason's platform for real estate education, a forum for important real estate topics, and George Mason's connection to the commercial real estate industry. Uh, we are happy to be supported by some of the leading companies in our area that work in the real estate industry, and we're grateful for their support and advice for us to be able to provide educational programming such as the one we're having this evening. If you're interested in supporting real estate education at George Mason University, uh, please contact me at my email there below. So this evening, we are talking about the growth of crowdfunding real estate investments. The Jumpstart Our Business uh, Startups or the Jobs Act was passed in 2012 to ease security regulations for investments. This has opened the way for a broader range of investors to participate in commercial real estate projects that were traditionally funded only by institutional investors. In the 10 years since the JOBS Act, billions of dollars of real estate equity has been raised through crowdfunding platforms. And tonight, we're gonna to learn about some of these uh, crowdfunding models and their impact on real estate development. Tonight, we have two speakers who represent uh, different platforms within uh, the crowdfunding industry in real estate. Uh, our first speaker is, is Abe Picker, uh, the founder and CEO of Small Change. Small Change is a crowdfunding platform that matches investors with developers of projects with social impact. With a background as an architect, city planner, urban designer, developer, uh, community development strategist, and publisher, and, and overall uh, instigator, Eve has developed a dozen buildings in blighted neighborhoods, launched a Pittsburgh-focused uh, e-zine called Pop City, and founded and organized a speaker series called City Live on city-centric issues. She has taught urban design and participated in sustainable design assessment teams for the American Institute of Architects in cities from Los Angeles to Springfield, Ohio, helping with urban design and to set a strategic course for downtowns and housing developments. Our second speaker is Danielle Sherman, Managing Director of CrowdStreet. Uh, Dan is responsible for CrowdStreet's marketplace solutions across the Mid-Atlantic and Northeast. CrowdStreet has crowdfunded over $2.4 dollars in 540 commercial real estate offerings since 2014. It has become a major provider of online commercial real estate investment offerings, technology, and services. Commercial real estate developers and operators use CrowdStreet technology to raise capital online, manage their investors and investments in order to lower their cost of capital and improve efficiencies. So with that, I will turn over the screen to Eve for a high level explanation of crowdfunding in real estate. So hello everyone. Um, I've been tasked with just giving you a, a, a high level overview of, um, of the industry that the Jobs Act basically kick-started in March of 2012. It looks a little complicated from the outside because there are three rules of play here and they all came into existence at different times. So different pl crowdfunding platforms um, really use different regulations to do different things. So first in March 2012, the House passed the Jobs Act. And I think its broadest purpose was to move capital formation from behind closed doors to the World Wide Web. And that was an absolute first, right? It was really to democratize investment in a number of ways. And, but implementation of that legislation really took over four and a half years to, to roll out. The first, the first part, the first rule that was implemented was 506C in September of 2013. And you will hear from Dan who CrowdStreet was really built based on that rule. I think you launched in 2014, if I'm, if I'm correct. And then in 2015, um, Regulation A or A plus was implemented, which permitted much larger offerings um, 
pretty loan-sized offerings and fundraise really built themselves around that rule. Um, and then in November of 2015, the SEC finalized regulations for a brand new rule called Regulation Crowdfunding, which wasn't implemented until the middle of 2016. And that was really the SEC's first attempt to truly democratize investment. That rule permits anyone um, 18 and over to invest in businesses or real estate, often on crowdfunding platforms called funding portals. Funding portals are registered with the SEC and they're members of FINRA, and they're almost like broker deal alike, sort of manage all the regulations around making sure that investors um, are safeguarded in this investment industry. And the final step of this process actually happened in March of 2021, this year. We don't think it's the we don't think it's the last chapter, but so far it is. The SEC went ahead and raised the issuer cap for regulation crowdfunding, which previously had only been 1.07 million per year. And they raised it to $5 million, along with some other rule changes which permit people to invest more. And that has kicked off a new flurry of activity as this rule is seen as a, a more viable one for raising money now. That's basically, that's the history. Okay, I'm gonna hand it over. Eric, I think you're on mute. You're on mute, Eric. All right, first one to do it. Um, so uh, thank you very much, Eve. And, and now we turn it over to Dan to uh, discuss the uh, CrowdStreet platform um, of crowdfunding. Great, and thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. It's good to meet everyone virtually. It's I see some familiar names on the attendee list. And Eric, thank you for putting this together. And Eve, it's great for you to be my compadre as we're going through this whole explanation of the new world of raising online, uh, crowdfunding online. So what I'm going to do is I'll I put some slides together that can go through just the general evolution of what's been happening over the past couple of years from a crowdfunding perspective, and then also just what CrowdStreet does today. And so in simplistic form, before there was the Securities Act of 1933, you're really only able to raise equity or raise for individual deals through 506B, through pre-existing relationships and people that you knew. Now what happened through the Jobs Act of 2012 that even mentioned, it took everything that you had to do in person in the real world and took it all online with the regulation 506C and allowing for general solicitation online. And this is where Crouchy really saw the intersection between technology and real estate in a digital fashion. And the reason why there was this huge opportunity is because historically before 2013, a majority of the real estate investing in a commercial world has been from pension funds, endowments, and family offices, along with individuals, some that may even be on the, the Zoom today. What CrowdStreet saw was a total addressable market of those 13 million US accredited investors with a total net worth of $66 trillion. And our vision was to bring that investment into an online form. And again, just what we're doing is we're taking traditional online fundraising and merging that with online. And the way that we're able to do that is we're working really closely with institutional investors, banks, and pension funds on one side, but also we've built a fantastic technology, a great reputation with investors and developers across the United States and even some in the DC metro area to raise equity online. And again, this is all limited partnership equity. And feel free as I'm going through this presentation, I know, and Eric, I don't. I know that you wanted some time for Q and A, but feel free to populate the Q and A section or raise your hand with any questions as I'm going through the presentation tonight. And what we're really excited to show is that there's just been a huge boom in online fundraising for real estate, similar to all online investing through Robinhood and other examples. But we're seeing a huge hockey stick growth from $16 billion raised online in 2014 to over $68 billion going to be raised in crowd on online through 506c offerings today this year and what's crowdstreet doing our essence is really just reinvesting the way to invest online 
and democratizing real estate investing, investing for any accredited investor across the United States. And it's really exciting. We were really founded in 2013 with our first deal launching in 2014, where we raised a million dollars in a month. And to date, we've raised over $2.4 billion. We've doubled how much we've raised year over year since inception. And in 2019, we raised roughly $520 million, excuse me. And we're expecting to double in COVID. We still grew to raising over $640 million online. So really exciting. And again, to date, we've raised $2.4 billion this way. And this is not from large institutional checks. This is from everyone on the phone today, individual accredited investors writing checks directly into the operating agreement and the LLC. To take it a step further, we have a proven track record of what we've done for investors. Again, for sponsors, we've raised $2.4 billion across 540 deals. To get there, we have 184,000 individuals roughly today that receive our deal flow, and over 104,000 of those investors are pre-approved accredited. You may be wondering, have you realized deals? As an investor, you've raised $2.4 billion. Yes, we've round-tripped and distributed over $275 million back to investors with a realized equity multiple of 1.4 and just about a 17 and a half net to investor IRR, net of all fees. And what's this doing is it's creating this flywheel effect. If anyone's familiar with the Jim Collins book, Good to Great, where as more sponsors come to the marketplace, we're getting bigger and, more, and bigger allocations from them. Our average raise right now is anywhere from five to $35 million. And I'll get to what our average growth has been per raise. But again, as this is, we're tracking more investors and we're able to fund better and better projects as time goes on. We could talk about all the national projects that we've done across the United States, but we're really excited. I'm from the DC area. I went to a competitive master's program at Georgetown, which I graduated in August of 2019. But we've been participating actually side by side with Eric and team at George Mason. We raised $22.3 million for the Ray, the Folger Pratt project. And Eric, I think you all invested in that deal, correct? Um, yes, our, our student managed real estate investment fund was, was an investor in that deal. That's great. And so we're not just raising multifamily, especially in DC, we raised 9.8 million for an office deal with four points. Buccini Poland, a large hotel operator, six point, almost 6.3 million for the Noma Marriott in Washington, DC. UIP Urban Investment Partners, we raised $13.2 million for their broadcast departments. And even Medical Office in Rockville, almost $6.5 million for Morning Calm. So again, this is all accredited investors. These large enterprise and tenured experienced sponsors are coming to CrowdStreet to raise all this equity online. Historically, they may have gone to private institutions or high net worth individuals. But now, again, they're going to the 60 or 70 of us that are on the Zoom today. And what's really exciting is year over year, not only have we raised more and more in total aggregate, but our average raise has grown year over year. 2014, our average raise again was $525,000. 2018, it was 2.2 million. Last year in 2020, even in the midst of COVID, our average raise was almost $7.3 million. And to date, it's 10.1 million. We'll probably end the year with our average raise being closer to $11 million. So again, the flywheel effect that we talk about online and something that Eve is talking about as well is as more investors are comfortable investing online, more sponsors are coming to us and developers are coming to CrowdStreet to raise limited partnership equity through this means. Eric, uh, there's a question from Arturo. Can I jump in and address this now or do you want to wait until the end? Um, right. well, looks like yeah, Eve we'll, is going to answer that. Okay. We'll, yeah, we'll address questions later. Why don't you go ahead and end? Okay, cool. And what's really interesting is that the investors on CrowdStreet are really sticky. The average investor, there's 67% of our investors make more than one investment. And those average repeat investors have over six investments on CrowdStreet for almost $300,000. So again, that flywheel effect continues to go through and through from the sponsor side for more sponsors are coming to CrowdStreet, as well as if Eric or Eve become new CrowdStreet investors, they're not just going to invest once, they're going to invest multiple times on CrowdStreet. And we've worked with over 255 sponsors across the United States, 
all ranging from groups that have done a couple hundred million to a couple billion, such as Graystar. About 60% of our deal flow has come from groups that have done over 500 million or more of total capitalization as a firm. And again, there's multiple benefits to investors. Investors, the CrowdStreet team has an investments team where we vet every project and sponsorship. We have an easy digital experience. It's all through digital ACHing or signing online. And you're able to diversify your investments as an investor online. Investors really think about us as their online stock portable for real estate, where they're looking at their multifamily project, their medical office building, and their traditional office building all through the CrowdStreet software in the back end. And for sponsors, they're able to have an efficient means to raise equity. They maintain full control rights for the project because it's all limited partnership equity. And they're able to start to build a brand in the future of raising equity online. And again, we have sponsor approval, deal review, quality control, where we do we review third-party reports and review all the documents on behalf of all the investors. And to end, what's really exciting is, is that, again, we're not just regionalized to deals based in the Washington, D.C. area. Almost 50% of our deal flow has come from projects in the South, with the rest spread pretty equally across the United States in the West, Northeast, and Midwest. Multifamily makes up most of our deal flow with over 40%. And then hotels and hospitalities make up around 10%. And traditional and medical office include around 10% total. But we're really known for our value add and development projects. So it's really exciting to work with a diversified group of sponsors and then bring great deals to the CrowdStreet investor base. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Dan. Um, just as a reminder, as Dan mentioned, if you have a question, please put it in the uh, QA um, and we will do a moderated QA after uh, all the presentations. Um, and um, now we'll turn it over to Eve. Um, you know, we, we're, we're excited to, to welcome both CrowdSheet and Small Change because they address different parts of the market, as well as have different, different kinds of platforms that address different real estate needs. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think as Dan had mentioned, George Mason has a student managed real estate investment fund. And we have actually invested in property both on Crowd Street as well as Small Change. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Eve for the presentation on Small Change crowdfunding platform. Hello, can everyone hear me? <laughs> um, I'm Red. It's really a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, uh, but I can, let me just start by saying, you know, regulation crowdfunding, which is primarily the role that we use on our platform is really in a very different place right now compared to 5 or 6C. I think the industry on the whole reached the $1 billion mark raised last week. $1 billion since the inception of the rule. So we're talking about um, a lot more smaller, smaller offerings than in the 5 or 6C space. Um, and in addition, most of that money has been raised um, for business, businesses, small businesses all across the country. So real estate is a tiny fraction of that $1 billion. And we are um, an unusual and fairly unique uh, crowdfunding platform dedicated to that role um, in real estate. So that, that's where I would like to start. So we're an impact-driven real estate crowdfunding platform. So we, we, we work on matching investors with developers who are building transformative change-making real estate projects. And we work all over the US um, and investors can become an investor on our platform if they're 18 and over in just 16 seconds. So I think the thing that everyone realizes is that Financial technology is really democratizing the capital markets, but perhaps they don't realize how fast that's happening. So it's really happening faster than social media disrupted traditional media. Financial technology has emerged very quickly to provide access to a huge variety of services online. We don't deposit checks at the bank anymore. We use our cell phones. Bitcoin, blockchain, online investing, everything has arrived. Um, and the time to amass adoption is head spinning. So it took about 12 years for 70% of Americans 
to report using social media in their daily lives. By comparison, um, last year alone, the, the use, the adoption of fintech products regularly to people's lives soared by an additional 30%. So now Americans, um, maybe 88% of them, use fintech in their daily lives. That's a really extraordinary, um, extraordinary thing that's happening. And at the same time, um, it's noteworthy that 8% of the Forbes fintech 50s are real estate startups. So equity crowdfunding, Reg CF, really reflects that trend very, very well. Um, despite the horrible year that 2020 was, you can see that um, by comparison to traditional venture capital activity, online fundraising activity has soared. And this chart actually ends at the end of the first quarter when the new rules, the upgrades to regulation crowdfunding came into play, which now permit issuers to raise even more money. So we expect these numbers to continue, continue to soar, continue to get even stronger. But you know, this is our place in the marketplace. It's really, it's really a very it's really a very different animal than CrowdStream. We consider ourselves the first and perhaps the only equity crowdfunding platform that is focused on unlocking um, impact investing in real estate. And we estimate that market segment conservatively to be $160 billion. The way we estimate that is we looked at private construction spending, we ignored government spending, we ignored nonprofit spending, although a lot of affordable housing is built in the nonprofit sector. And we looked at urban population in 2020. And if you assume that it's only in the urban markets that maybe 20% of those deals are addressing impact in issues and that small change could be filling 10% of the capital stack, we arrived at $160 billion. I mean, 2020 was the perfect storm. Everyone is interested in impact now. So what is real estate impact investing? One of the things I love about regulation crowdfunding is that it requires us to describe deals in plain English. We're not allowed to use words like sponsor or capital stack that the general public don't know, have never heard before and don't understand. You know, someone who's investing for the first time really needs to be explained things clearly. So we looked around for an ES, ESG index that we thought explained Siri things impact clearly, and we couldn't find one. So we built our own proprietary change index. And we, we use this to measure um, offerings or projects that come to us like to raise money. If, if a project does not score at least 60%, on our change index, and it's really not a good fit for our platform. We we're not gonna be raising money for a Dunkin' Donuts on a greenfield um, or um, you know, a microtel out in the suburbs. It's just not a good fit and they can go other places to find money. So we think about impact in three buckets. One is the projects and how they impact the place because we really wanna focus on building better communities, affordable, equity, equitable and innovative places. And we focus on the people who are building those projects because right now the real estate industry is pretty well all white and all male. And third, we focus on the investors and giving people who've never had access to investing a chance to invest in the people and places they love. So you can see here, this is just a little survey of the projects we've listed to date and, and the, the um, the overall score, scores those projects have received um, for, for some of our some of our impact indices. We're actually not allowed to share those scores um, as members of FINRA. We're not allowed to curate the projects, so we simply show the you know our little icon with the check marks um, to show what impact that project is making. And these are our developers. This is really contrary to the real estate industry that we all, all know. Um, just a sidebar, I was the only female developer in Pittsburgh for a very long time. And that I think is just 
completely appalling. So to date, about 50% of our developers have been either women or a minority. Um, and that reach is growing. We spend very little on marketing to developers and we have a really strong lead fault flow of people coming to us wanting to do deals and many developers coming back a second and a third time, which, which, is, which is great because they're having a good experience. Um, we have listed projects all over the country and that reach is also growing. Um, we're gonna be adding a couple more places to that list in the next month. And of course, there's the investors. So anyone 18 and over can invest on our site. Um, they uh, can invest as, as little as $200. Um, the only criteria is the one that the SEC has provided under that rule. There are limits as to how much um, a non-accredited investor can invest. Those limits are based on their um, income and net worth. There are no limits for accredited investors. They can self-verify and invest as much as they like. Um, so everyone gets to invest in the same project, in the same pool, with the same return, at the same time. So our platform, like it has two sides to it, right? We're, we're addressing uh, investors and how they onboard and we're addressing issuers and how they onboard. And that's two very different processes. Um, the uh, onboarding for investors is entirely electronic. We build it ourselves, we own the technology. Um, it's uh, an invest now button, which automatically generates an investment agreement. Um, funds are transferred into an escrow account as required by the SEC. And when the developer reaches their funding goal, then we will close the deal and send the developer the funds along with all the information that we've got about investors. So that's kind of the easy part. The harder part is onboarding developers because we don't really have cookie cutter deals, right? Um, our, our bottom line is impact. Um, and uh, we have, and, and this rule is quite complicated. We're not supposed to assist developers. Um, the SEC sees up us, these funding portals, as a third party neutral marketing platform. So for example, if, if a developer were to bring us a disclosure packet, we would be required to have it reviewed by our attorney. And for small developers, that gets pretty expensive. So we've inverted the process and we have created a, 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 almost a white label template that can be used to create these disclosure packets um, and really follow all of the SEC guidelines for compliance. So we'll work with developers in really simple intake forms, helping them put that together. Sometimes that's really fast, sometimes it's slower. It depends on the developer's readiness. Um, and once the, uh, the packet is ready, we register with the SEC and we will uh, list the offering on our site and go live. So I, you know, people ask us who our competitors are. It's just a very difficult space because as I said before everyone's really doing something slightly different with different rules and so it's very hard to kind of compare ourselves like if you wanted to say well you know you can invest a little on fundrise and, and someone told me that fundrise had just dropped their minimum to 250 so this slide is now old um, you can say yeah that's right it's they're democratizing investment opportunities for investors but you can't on Fundrise invest in a project you select. You have to basically invest in a blind pool. So there's a difference there. Or well, ground floor lets you invest $10, but all you can invest in there is fix and flips. So every one of these platforms has a different, really a different market. This is a nascent early industry. And I think we're, it's pretty hard to make comparisons of this really early stage, but I will say I don't, I, I don't know of a crowdfunding platform that is fully focused on impact except the small change. And that, that is us. I thought I would take a moment and um, actually show you a couple of deals. Let me just share the screen again. 
because it's easier than people. So here's our platform. And on our platform, we actually really care about these issues. So you can sort by affordable housing or minority led projects or women led, or even by the creative economy projects that are open to everyone versus projects open to accredited investors. And it's a pretty simple site to use. You can scroll down and each tile describes in brief, um, as far as FINRA will let us on this homepage, um, uh, what, uh, what each offering is about and how much they have raised to date. So um, I'm not supposed to discuss five offerings with you. So here's a really good example of one in um, Baltimore, which I think Eric, you said you invested in, right? Yeah, yes, our, our student yeah. fund, yes. This is our standard page. Um, really, the only reason why someone needs to, to open an account on our site is if they want to invest. We are very transparent about everything we do. And we provide very similar information for each offering to make it easier for our investors to be able to follow along. We have a lot of repeat investors and we feel that if the information is consistently offered then it makes it a little bit easier for them. So that's a really standard page. Um, uh, another one, let's see, we actually have another one live in, in Baltimore right now, which I would encourage you to, to look at. And we have done a couple in DC, Avery and Washington listed 3451 Benning with us. This was a few years ago and that was a pretty successful offering. Um, and also a affordable housing project um, called Malmboro Pike. So those are the four in your vicinity, but you can see we have many different types of offerings, everything from a tiny house to um, the reuse of vacant warehouses to the pretty creative array of projects. So um, with that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna end this, stop sharing. Happy to answer any questions. I think you're on mute again, Eric. Huh. Sorry. Thanks very much for our two speakers for, uh, as you can see, this is a, although this is a, an industry that's in its uh, early stages of development, uh, you know, a lot of different players are, are exploring different different models. Um, they're all addressing different niches in the real estate market. I, I guess let me start off the question with some questions of my own. Um, so, I guess to to Dan, um, you had a something in your slide that that said that this is a attractive alternative to you know, seasoned sponsors versus going to traditional route of finding an institutional, um, a set of institutional investors. Uh, you know, what are the benefits of, crowd, of, of crowdfunding? Uh, what used to be, you know, crowdfunding and attracting a, you know, 200 or 250 investors for a, for a project versus uh, a, a uh, a developer going out and, and finding two or three institutional partners? What, what changed and, and what's the benefit that the industry is finding with, with your model? Yeah, good question. And so there's a place obviously for institutional capital in our mind. There are partners of ours on a lot of the deals, some of the larger equity checks that we just can't get to. So we can only raise up to $35 million right now of LP equity. The couple of benefits that sponsors and developers are seeing is that it's all limited partnership equity. So the investors that come in, so myself, Eve, and Eric write checks into each individual deal. We are signing the operating agreement and subscription agreement for the deal, for the project as a limited partner. So the three of us as investors have no control rights for the project. And so as you're doing a development project, we all can attest that control is one of the most important things, especially if, as a local operator. So the way that the structure of the projects are and the raising the equity on CrowdStreet, the sponsor maintains full control. That's one. Two is that we can be either the full 90 of the 90-10 outside of their co-invest or we could be partial. 
So for a developer that may have institutional capital already and they can only do five deals a year with one group, but a sixth may come by, we could fill that void for that sixth deal. If for another example, the institutional partner can only get to 20 million out of the 30 million of the equity raise, we could supplement the remaining 10 million and it's all limited partnership equity. On the other hand, if a sponsor may only raise money from friends and family or high net worth individuals, so they're used to what's called syndicating the equity, we're just an online means to raise the equity online because we're just syndicating the equity. We're not crowdfunding and then writing one check for $10 million. So the, with the average check of 50K, for example, I don't, I'm not saying that that's what the average check is today, but if it were to be that for a $10 million raise, there may be 200 investors that come into that project. And so again, the sponsor maintains control. It's flexible capital. The sponsor up, uh, chooses the real, the waterfall structure, as well as the fees to propose to the investor base. Crowdstreet does this all digitally. So we vet the deal and then we also raise the money all online. So it's really efficient from a time perspective. You can go raise $10 million from your desk, Eric. You don't need to go have coffees and meetings in person. And so it's a really efficient way to do this online now. And then also a lot of people, and we believe at Crowdstreet, this is the future of raising capital. The, the pie is going to continue to grow from the investor perspective. So it's always important, and sometimes I think this is the number one, number two reason, is building a brand online with these 184,000 investors. Because as, as you saw, the average repeat investor invests in six deals. So Eric, if you have a great deal that launches and it's oversubscribed, a lot of investors want to get in that next deal, or if they have a good experience, they're ready to invest in that second project. So it becomes more and more efficient over time. What about what about the the pricing or the the yield on the on the on the raise? How does that compare to going to the traditional route versus the crowdfunding route for commercial projects? Are you saying are the yields better for a sponsor to come to us or for an investor? Yeah, as, as the price of the capital, basically. How does that compare to the traditional route? For it's, yeah, good question. It's very comparable because in the end, the developer or sponsor is able to dictate the terms that they want to propose to CrowdStreet and the net and the end investor, along with any fees, including property management, asset management, construction management, and any financing fees. So similar to when they go to the traditional private equity route, they're able to include those fees in there. It depends on the deal and how they're all structure may be. Sometimes it's more creative, sometimes it's not. It really depends on the deal that they've had with their old investors, whether it be friends and family or private equity firms. Okay. And and question for Eve and probably for Dan as well. So along with the de democratization of, of, you know, access for investors, you know, some of these, some of these um, sponsors may end up with a larger number of investors than they may traditionally be used to. Um, so how, how has the experience been in terms of managing that number of investors? Um, you know, maybe I'll start with Eve for your sponsors, yeah. you guys, and, and then maybe Dan can speak to that as well on, on the commercial side. Well, we, uh, as we don't have, um, a role in the projects, they're really not our investors, but this keeps coming up. Um, certainly many developers are very scared of that number of investors. So we, we're actually going to be rolling out some um, investor management services soon as we're talking to larger and larger developers. But I, you know, from what I'm hearing, for the most part, um, these investors are incredibly grateful that they can participate. And we've conducted some Zoom meetings with developers like, um, like Adrian Washington, and they're just thrilled to be able to talk to the developer and be part of it. I mean, this is now, this is at least our investors who are more often than not on credit, not always. When someone asks what the difference is between an accredited and non-accredited investor, and I would say a non-accredited investor is someone who's been left out of any investment opportunities before the job set, right? The accredited investor is like a, 3% of the population who have net worth of at least a million dollars and in, or, or income of 250,000 a year mm -hmm. for three years. Now, if you think about that, that means an accredited investor likely has to live in New York, Florida, Texas, or California 
certainly probably not in Pittsburgh, or there'll be way fewer of them. So it's really a very unfair look at the population in terms of who gets to invest or not. So non-accredited investors are the remainder, 97% of the population who until the Jobs Act could not invest in any of these deals. Dan? At Crowdtree, we're very software and technology for focused where we wouldn't be able to manage the 200 investors without a software. So we provide technology and backend infrastructure for the developers to manage the 100, 200 investors where each individual investor would have their own deal room where they would be able to pull down the tax documents or quarterly reports. And so it's really easy if you think about it just from an investor room perspective, but on the sponsor side, it's more of a one-to-many type of communication where you're able to send one email to 100 or 200 investors, but it's still customized. Additionally, we allow for someone of a message board for the investors to be able to post questions. So if Eric and Dan and Eve are involved in an investment and say, when's the quarterly report supposed to be sent? Eric may be able to answer Eve's question, say it's the X date after the quarter's closed. And so it's a real interactive experience while the sponsor has the ability to also answer on that message board. So for us, we, allow, we provide software to allow this to scale. They will need some type of investor relations or asset management individual to manage the investors. We do take that into account when we approve sponsors because if the investor experience is subpar because there's not someone to manage the 100 or 200 investors, then it just won't be a great experience for CrowdStreet, the sponsor or the investor. And we just, we're not interested in groups like that today, even if they've had billions and billions of dollars of experience, just because they're not going to be set up for success and it's just going to be a faulty experience. So we are also integrating with other investor relations software to make this more scalable as well. Just a, just a clarification question from the audience. Um, and we've touched on this briefly uh, just a few minutes ago. What is the difference between an accredited and a non-accredited investor? And I think as Eve mentioned, an accredited investor uh, by SEC rules, there's, there's a few criteria but two of the biggest criteria is one, you um, have a million dollars of net worth, uh, excluding some some of your some, without, some assets. Without your, without your yeah, we'll we, we judge your house right. and require, yeah, exactly. And then, uh, or you can qualify as an accredited investor by your income, as, as Eve said, about two hundred fifty thousand dollars for uh, what is it? Even the last three years. That's um, right. And. Um, for for most platforms, you can as 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 Dan mentioned, you can you can self certify, or there's some platforms also use third party certifications. Like you go to a, another website where somebody can evaluate um, your uh, accredited uh, status. And non accredited is if you're outside that, then you're considered a, considered a non accredited investor. Um, so just just for a clarification, as that came up in the uh, in the uh, point. One question for even um, from the audience is um, how has crowdfunding been used for raising equity for affordable housing? Well, we've certainly been involved. It's a difficult, it's a difficult thing to do because to keep uh, housing affordable, you really don't want to return a lot to investors, right? Otherwise, the more you return, the more expensive it gets for people who occupy the housing. But we. We raised money for a homeless housing project in um, LA, which was incredibly successful. And um, they're gonna come back with a second project shortly. And there are many of our projects have affordable housing component to them. So for example, they can be complicated capital stacks where they might use new market tax credits or, or other money like that. And then they can afford to pay equity investors a, a reasonable return. So it really kind of depends, but it's absolutely possible. Okay. Um, question for both of you. Um, how does the investment contract work? If I invest, say, $10,000 in a particular project, what determines my percentage share of the project or the profit? And how do you allocate shares if, for example, $2 million of, in, of, of capital wants to invest in a $1 million deal on, on a platform, or only 500,000 is raised if you're trying to raise a million dollar deal. 
So how do how do those situations get handled on, on your platform? So maybe start with Dan. So for each of our projects, it takes about 75 to 90 days, roughly right now, from when we receive the first deal information from a sponsor to be fully funded. And we have a, an investment committee review process that takes anywhere from a couple of weeks to get to a term sheet. And in that time, we're discussing what the waterfall structure, promote, and returns would are projected to be for the individual investor. Again, we do not recommend any deals. It's the sponsors that are issuing the securities right now through the 506C offering. So the online syndication that happens when we launch the project that goes out to the 184,000 individuals, Eric and Eve are gonna be signing an operating agreement and subscription agreement that outline all those that waterfall structure and the expected returns and the thresholds and the fees. They have a PPM, so more of a, what's called a private placement memorandum, which outlines all risks associated to the investment as well. So the expected returns are really due to the waterfall structure that the sponsor is going to be proposing, and that could be based off of cash flow or if there's a capital event, including what would be a refinance and or sale of a project. And what if what if um, more capital is wanting to be in, or if you don't reach the, the capital you targeted? Yeah, so we're a best efforts platform, and so our minimum investment for per investor is $25,000, and then you can invest as much as you want based off of what your discretion may be. We always ask that we have the sponsors be ready that, because again, we are a best efforts platform today, but we typically reach those investments. We've done 550 plus deals so far. And so we have a great number of data points for us to achieve those raises. And so the investors are able to, if they want to invest more in that project, if there may be you know, a gap between what our raise is and where we currently are, the investors are able to invest now if they so choose. They would have to change the documents, of course. But then the investor, the sponsor can also just what we would call backfill that project where there's a gap of $200,000. They may find another investor or they may put more money into the project. It's up to the invest in, into the sponsor of how they so choose to do the project. Okay. And, and Eve on, 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 on a small change? There are no cookie cutter projects on our site. So we certainly have projects that have waterfalls, which I don't know if everyone in the audience understands what a waterfall is, but it looks something like this. You might say, okay, first, if there's money available, we're going to make sure that all investors get an 8% return, preferred return. And second, if they don't get it in one year, it's going to accrue and they get paid in the next year. And and, and third, at the end of a project, and that end might be, we're going to uh, refinance it or we're going to sell it, there's a split where um, some of the profit will go to the investors and some of the profit will go to the sponsor or the developer. That's kind of a pretty typical waterfall, okay? Um, and um, so that's one way to look at it, but when you have a, when you have an affordable housing project or a homeless housing project, which is never going to be an asset that increases in value, that waterfall makes absolutely no sense. And so we've done projects where it's just a preferred term, preferred return, you know, for the life of the project and then they get the equity back. Or it might be a promissory note. So I, I think, you know, I think, um, returns to investor kind of only limited by the creativity of, of the developer. Also, sometimes there are some very complicated affordable housing projects which have new market tax credit partners like US Bank or there are historic tax credits or all sorts of things flow into that calculation. So, um, you know, all of that, all of that has to be taken into account. At least on our platform, we try and work with a developer to come up with a as, as simple an explanation as possible for these investors so they understand how they're going to get their money back and more. So there's a series of questions here that I'll just summarize into together. So the, the original role of the SEC in, in raising, um, regulating, raising equity was to make sure that um, investors were aware of the risk associated with the projects and also to regulate the risk going to particular types of investors. So how does crowdfunding make sure that the investors, whether they're large investors that are accredited or small investors that are non-accredited, 
um, have an understanding of the risk in investing in a given project. So maybe we'll start with you first and then go to Dan. So um, I can't even list the number of ways we tell investors about the risks. And, and FINRA and the SEC um, really, when they audit us, when they surveil our site, that's really what they're looking for. So we have risk disclosures in the footer, which and I've been negotiating added language for FINRA because they're not satisfied with it. We have risk disclosures when you go to invest, like eight things that you have to check off that say, I understand I may lose all my money. I understand that I this is an illiquid um, investment. So people have to check those off. When they open an account, they must get an email that sends them to educational material, which has all of those risks in it, plus tells them again, you know, this is this, you're taking a risk. Um, we have really robust risk appendix attached to every one of our disclosure packets. So risk is right up there, part of the discussion all the time. Dan? So, from a risk perspective, the sponsors are issuing the securities. And so based off of the 506C, from my understanding, again, we, I would always recommend to talk to a securities lawyer is first and foremost with what it is because the sponsor is, is issuing the securities. And so it would be based off of the risk disclosures and recommendations of their own individual lawyers, but what they would need to disclose. The typical documents are all listed on the CrowdStreet marketplace right now for any of the risk disclosures, which include the private placement memorandum, which outlines any of the risks associated to a project that every sponsor would need to put on the CrowdStreet marketplace. And so the three main documents are the PPM operating agreement subscription agreement and any other risks, disclosures and information regarding the SEC and FINRA and everything that the sponsor would need to do. They work with their own securities lawyer to put everything together. Crabtree does not recommend or do anything along those lines. Okay. So there's a there's a question in here about um, um, lending, associated with lending. So uh, if I may point out, you know, Dan and Eve are presenting two business models, but there are, are other crowdfunding models out there that um, are lending models, not equity models. Um, and also, as mentioned before, there, there's like Fundrise, which may be known to a lot of people in the audience since they're based here in DC, are kind of more of a blind pool model where you invest in a pool that then buys the properties for you or on your behalf. Um, and you own, a, you own a small small sliver of it. So just pointing out that there are other crowdfunding models out there um, as the mark, as this industry you know, kind of develops. Do, you, do both of you have any uh, additional comments on that and how the, the, the crowdfunding industry is sort of developing into new niches and, and developing into new products. Do you, want, do you want to go down? Yeah, I think it's very interesting to just see the evolution of what's been happening across the marketplaces overall. Uh, it looks like there was a question two min a minute ago just about the requirements from different sponsors. As different platforms may have different level of sponsorships and you may see sponsors across multiple platforms as well. I think it's just really interesting of the comfortability from what I've seen just for investors to invest more online as technology continues to grow. And that what we're doing again, our, one of our initial slogans and taglines was democratizing real estate investing. So when can Eric, even Dan from DC be able to invest in a project in downtown Los Angeles? or Seattle, Washington, unless they knew the people. So I think the diversification of sponsorship, location of deals, and the just overall amount of equity that's going to be brought and have the ability to be invested online is going to be phenomenal over the next couple of years. Anything to add, Eve? Um, not really. I mean, there are different, there are, I, yeah, I just think we're going to see more and more diverse offerings. We, we certainly we have a, a little promissory note deal on our side at the moment, which we haven't done before, and we'll probably do again for a nonprofit because they can't really raise equity because <laughs> they're a nonprofit. So I think you know we're gonna we're just gonna see more diverse things appear. I, I agree with Dan. And one other item to just add is that on CrowdStreet, developers are able to raise for individual assets 
They're able to raise for portfolios, so multiple assets and grouping them together. They're also able to raise for their own sponsored funds. So a lot of groups come to us to raise equity for their own limited partnership fund or what's called a general partnership fund. And we even had some groups come on and raise mez mezzanine funding for on CrowdStreet. But again, it's all in the limited partnership capacity. So the sponsor maintains control. And I think also what's interesting is, is a majority of our deals in COVID world are now more development focused due to the timelines to close a project. We also do a lot of recapitalization. So I think as deals become harder to find, there may be more recapitalizing of projects online or just in other needs because they just can't they may not be able to cycle capital or recoup some capital out of those projects. Well, that, that leads us to our next question. So how do you, you know, we, we talked about how you underwrite your investors uh, in, in the deals. How do you underwrite the developers or the sponsors? Um, what are your requirements for, for developers to participate on your platforms and offer um, their investments to the public? Um, let's start with, start with Eve and then we'll go with Dan. So, you know, regulation crowdfunding has um, overall requirements that we must perform, no matter if we're doing real estate or anything else. Um, so the SEC requires us to run background checks, very specific background checks. Um, we are required to make sure that the developer has the bookkeeping knowledge and skills to manage investors. Um, and we do extra background checks ourselves, and there are a, a variety of other things that we're going to provide us with corporate documents, et cetera, et cetera. But for us at our end, um, we, uh, our, our, our top requirement is that they fit our impact um, index. And if the project is not a fit with the impact index, then that's an immediate no. We do some early pre-screening to look for some obvious red flags. Um, we don't want to work with first-time developers. We really feel that someone who doesn't know how to put a bank packet together really should be putting um, a disclosure packet together. It's just too hard because we are, I think we have fairly high standards on our disclosure packets. So, we, so, um, so that, that's an absolute requirement. And, you know, we're a, crowd, we're a crowdfunding platform, a little different than CrowdStreet. So we do see people come with really completely inappropriate asks, or they might say to us, I want to raise a million dollars, my project is going to cost 600000 And like, that's a no. <laughs> so there's some very sort of strange things we see. We will we'll always look, ask for the address, the, uh, the developer website, we'll do some background research. And if we like what we see, we'll basically have a meeting with them, explain the process to them, explain to them exactly how much they will have to be engaged and what they have to produce. And if we still like what we see, we say, okay, it's up to you whether you want to sign up or stick agreement. And then we start on the really serious due diligence process of vetting the project. That's the way we work. Okay. And, and Dan? Yeah, and at Crowdtree, we have two types of reviews. The first is the sponsor approval, and then the second is the deal review. We have a couple individuals that just focus on sponsor approval right now, where there's a full detailed application. We run background checks and clear reports and verify the track record for all sponsors. Right now, the number one thing that Crowdtree Investment Committee, the capital markets team, and the investments and the investors are looking for is experienced sponsors. And so 60% of our deal flow roughly came from groups that have done over 500 million or more. And we have four different buckets of sponsorship. Again, years may vary, but zero to 100 million is technically what we call merging. 100 million to 500 million is what we call seasoned. Again, the years may change based off of how long they've been in business. Tenured right now is 500 million to 5 billion and enterprise is 5 billion and above. So again, 60% of our deal flow has come from the tenured and enterprise group over the past year, year and a half or so, which is really exciting. So sponsorship, that takes about a week or so to vet them and not everyone gets through it. So it's really important for sponsors as they come to the CrowdStreet Marketplace to basically say, we know that we've been vetted just as much as large enterprise and other groups. Can Last I add something? Can I add yes. something else? Yes. So Go ahead. Because we're doing these funky little, sometimes very unusual impact deals, um, Looking at them in terms of dollars isn't really possible, but um, really understanding the experience of the sponsor and the developer is absolutely critical. Like we, we just talked to someone who is building uh, portfolios of 
of, how, of trans, transition housing, which is not going to be in the billions or even the 500 million, but he's been doing it for a long time. So for us, that probably the experience is, is the leader. Yeah, and it's important, similar to what you're saying, is to look at the deal itself as well. So we look at the underwriting. We also look at for debt term sheets, make sure the PSA is there. We'll look for title, and we'll also look for a, basically about five to 10 other DD items that any lender would look for. We've added that to our due diligence checklist. So we want to make sure it's similar to items that, that Eve is looking for. And you could, as an investor, will be able to review a majority of those documents online. And there's a question here on... on um really, uh, I guess, the total cost to a to a sponsor. Um, so in addition to the return they're offering to the investors, there's, of course, the cost of the platform, the, the cost of the crowdfunding. So can you address that a little bit in terms of, you know, what does it cost to do crowdfunding? How does that compare to traditional means of, of raising capital? Uh, maybe we start with Dan first and then go to you. Yeah, right now there's no cost for an investor to invest through the Crowdtree marketplace. The there is fees that we work on with the sponsor in the overall deal. That's more on a fintech model and a software model, and so it's based off the number of investor rooms that are created, and it's tiered based off of that. Do do they find that their overall cost, the sponsor's cost, is comparable to a traditional yes. raise? Yeah. Or, or even better than a traditional raise? It's comparable to what the because a lot of crowd a lot of on um, a lot of sponsors use what's called equity brokers or capital markets brokers to raise capital for the project. And so there's always a, a, a more of a fixed fee. That's not how CrowdStreet operates, but there is always a the cost to the deal to raise that capital, whether it be for legal accounting or tax assessment, whatever so be it. So we're able to um, work with the sponsor to make everything work from a numbers perspective there. And, and even on your platform, since the amounts are are smaller in terms of the raises, um, you know, the costs of, the fixed costs of actually doing the raise must be uh, something that, you, you know, Right. We take a risk because we really need to, we need to really make sure that the developer we're onboarding is going to market. If they don't market the deal um, and they don't get in, because like we have investors, but people, their crowd is important. People want to invest in people they know and places they know. If they do no marketing, we don't get paid, right? Because under Reg CF, we get uh, we we are permitted to take com a commission, unlike 506C, where you probably have to come up with some sort of flat fee, right? We are almost like mini brokers light, so we charge a small onboarding fee, and then we charge a percentage of whatever is raised. So if they don't reach their goal, we get nothing of that percentage. So it's a bit it's a bit of a risk. Um, so we really want to bet projects that we think are going to succeed, obviously. Um, but um, it's a little trickier for us again because the rules say we can't be great. So we really have to be pretty even-handed in how we apply fees. You can, you can read them on our site. We, they're, they're there for the public to see um, and everyone gets charged the same amount. And I think it's comparable to working with the bank. On the other hand, we're pretty well all inclusive. So we do provide all of the paperwork necessary to put a disclosure packet together, precisely if the SEC wants to see it, a Reg CF offering. Um, we do have issuers that don't use an attorney. Okay. So um, my next question is, you both, you both showed really a, an exponential rise during COVID. Um, mm -hmm. and, and of course, during COVID, sort of our online lives, <laughs> both personal and I guess business expanded a lot. So, so do you, what, what, do you, what do you attribute that to? And, and, and is that, you think, a lasting effect for the crowdfunding industry in terms of raising capital online and doing a lot of things online? Um, and, and it, I guess you could address like the COVID impact 
on your business and what do you think the COVID impact is on the industry? Let's start with you first and then take down. Um, well, you know, I showed you the rise of fintech over the last year, which is really pretty extraordinary. Um, and so I attribute a lot to that, to the general comfort level of people investing online. Three years ago, they might have said, oh, I'm never going to invest online. Is that, is that safe? But people are becoming just much more comfortable with the idea that they don't need to go and talk to a teller at the bank. They can deposit their check with their phone. It's just become a part of life. So I do think that's part of it. But for us also, I think, you know, the eyes are on creating an equity landscape. So it's almost a perfect storm for a small change. We are certainly talking to way more issues than ever before. Um, it's, we are providing a space for them, for, for a very diverse set of people to try and put their next foot forward in the real estate industry. It's not an opportunity that's, that's been there before. So I don't know about those things. Dan, any thoughts on, on COVID impact? Yeah, for COVID for us, it was an interesting opportunity where we were still continuing to raise significant amount of LP equity online this way. And we almost have grown our active investor base by 2x in the midst of beginning of COVID and beginning of 2020. So we've just continued to grow just the investor and sponsor base, which is really exciting. I mean, for us to go from about mid five, low 500s to $640 million raised online in a given year, we were able to still show growth from equity raising. We brought on a lot of enterprise sponsors because what happened was, is the capital markets dried up a little bit where the debt may have gone from 70 or 75% leverage to mid sixties. And so there's an equity gap potentially. The CrowdTree investor base was still there and stayed strong. It actually grew in COVID. That's one example. And then two is if equity partners may have backed out, but the deal needed to still close on behalf of sponsors, we were still raising significant tens of millions of dollars per month on the CrowdTree marketplace in the midst of COVID. We raised over $200 million in Q4 2020 alone, just on CrowdStreet. And so... It's just showing the overall growth that we've had in the marketplace, even in the midst of COVID and beyond. And we at CrowdStreet expect it to continue to grow just because the sponsors continue to bring us more deal flow with higher raises and our investor base continues to expand. And Eva, I think I have a question that's particular to you. Um, uh, this, this question is, this member of the audience has seen many lending institutions such as Freddie Mac introduce various diversity initiatives. You had mentioned that you are trying to reach uh, people, sponsors that traditionally are, or, or find it hard to raise capital. Um, can you speak to how you how you do that? How do you reach these uh, developers you know, of color or, or the developers that are in minority communities? It's, how do you been encourage them? It, it, it's been a labor of love. Like this is really why we built our platform to create an equitable investment landscape. And it's, it's been a complete pleasure to see more and more BIPOC and female developers come to us because they've heard about us. So at this point, we've branded ourselves. We, we, we're just doing what we're doing. That's our brand. That's who we're reaching. And we're, we couldn't be happier. Um, the next three offerings to go live, two of them are BIPOC developers. So oh, I, I know what else should I do? <laughs> I don't know. Um, it's you know, it's it, word of mouth is a pretty powerful thing, I think. And I guess as a you know, to close off, um, I just throw this question to both of you. What do you think is going to happen to the crowdfunding space in the next year or two? Any, any, um, any predictions uh, of of how this is going to? to evolve into the next level? What is the next level uh, for both of your spaces? Uh, we start with uh, Dan and then go to E. What is the next level for you? Yeah, I think the next level is just continue. Well, there's a couple items. I keep going back to that flywheel effect that we have in CrowdTree, which is really exciting. 
Every new sponsor that we bring on gets the attention of one of their competitors or another thought leader in the space that says, I just saw Eric and Eve do their development deal on CrowdStreet. Tell me more. It's going to happen continuing more and more over the next year. What that then is going to do is bring on more investors. The returns have been strong for the current deals. The sponsorship is where else are you going to ever be able to invest online with these groups unless you go to an RIA or a large institution and put your money in those funds. You come to companies and websites like CrowdStreet. And additionally, what's happening is the piece of the pie of that deal is getting larger and larger for the CrowdStreet investor. And the average raise before was just a couple million dollars. Right now, we're over $10 million for our average equity raise on CrowdStreet. Next year, I, I don't know the numbers. We'll find out in the next couple of days of what our expected raise and corporate numbers will be, but we imagine that it will continue to grow. So again, increase better, continue great sponsors and repeat sponsors who we love that have trusted us over the past couple of years, have helped us build the brand, more investors and larger allocations on CrowdStreet's marketplace. So um, I'm thinking something slightly different is going to happen for us. And we've been seeing this happen over the last year as we've been reaching bigger and bigger developers, developers who realize that they can meaningfully engage community by using regulation crowdfunding. And so we're talking to developers who are building projects that are 3,000 units who really want to find a way to let that community invest, really invest in the project that they're putting up. And this is this has become a necessity. There are there are, I believe there are going to be cities that demand it with developers. So while we want to keep doing these direct deals, we also see um, something bigger happening on the sidelines as this little rule goes from being some crazy idea that a few people are pursuing to something that is perhaps a little more status quo. Okay, well, thank you very much to our speakers tonight. Uh, let me just share my screen for a second. And I really appreciate both Dan and Eve uh, taking time tonight to discuss the crowdfunding space. And it's, it's an exciting space, in many ways a quiet space that's gathering more attention as both of them had mentioned. Um, I just have a few quick announcements before we before we uh, leave. Um, our MS in real estate development uh, cl uh, class is now um, accepting applications for spring. If you're interested in graduate education in real estate, and I'd like to invite you to our next webinar on December 14th, which is a case study of a car-free neighborhood development called Cul-de-sac in Tempe, Arizona, one of the first of its kind in the United States. If you're interested, please feel free to give me an email. My email is there below and I will shoot you a link uh, to that webinar as well. So with that, um, again, I'd like to thank Dan and Eve for their time expertise. Uh, thank you for having us. Uh, George Mason, as I mentioned, our student fund is, is, has invested in both their platforms or will continue to look at deals on their platforms. Um, and we're really excited for um, you know, the development and expansion of, of this crowdfunding space uh, and its impact on commercial real estate. So we, we look forward to what happens in the next couple of years. Maybe we'll reconvene in a couple of years to, to see what happens. And I think the one thing we haven't mentioned is as, as your deals mature and, and get, you know, turn around and realize, I think that's the biggest validation is as more deals get, get validated and, and realized, then I think the, you know, I think that the, that virtual cycle that Dan was mentioning just keeps going for the industry. So thank you very much. And, and also thank to you. both of you for, for your, uh, and thank you for collaborating with Mason on this, on this, on this uh, program. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Eric, thank for hosting you. It's been fun. Okay, so with that, uh, thank, thank you. you. With that, thank you very much for joining George Mason University. Um, we look forward to everybody's participation at our next uh, real estate education program. Have a good evening. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.